to kick us off, what I'd like to do is to uh, waiting for uh, Jason who should be joining us shortly. So I'm going to go around and ask the investors to introduce themselves as our investor panelists. I'll do it first name alphabetical order, which is how I'll call on you for the questions. Can you please say your name, your average check size, and um, if you have a thesis? So we'll start with you, Andrea. You are first in the alphabet. Welcome. Okay. No more careful, careful karaoke for me this morning. <laughs> um, so my name is Andrea Zurich, and um, I'm with a venture fund called XG Ventures, and um, the G stands for Google. So we are a team of uh, ex Googlers from way back in the day, and we've been investing since 2008. And um, I guess some of our breakout uh, companies have been Wish most recently went public. Um, and then we had another company called Shift Technologies that just went public. But on average, we invest in about um, eight to 10 companies a year. And average check size is uh, usually in the six figures. So 100K plus. All right. Thank you so much. Andrew Lee, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Andrew Lee, a partner at Initialize Capital. We're the honey badgers of venture capital. We were the first check in Coinbase, uh, Flexport, Insta Instacart, uh, on the consumer side, uh, folks like Patreon. Um, our check size ranges from 500K and we top out around like four and a half million. It's fairly rare in that regard, but most frequent is usually between one to $3 million. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Yep. Anil, Anil from Soma. Hi, Anil Ranadive. Uh, great to be here. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Um, six years in uh, as a partner at Soma Capital, uh, 10 years before that, uh, spent time building different mostly consumer products. And our vision is a uh, software to automate the economy across any sector or geography. Um, we have uh, uh, 300 portfolio companies, um, mul multiple unicorns, uh, the likes of Alto Pharmacy, Rippling, Ironclad, Cruise, Rappi, among others. And we do typically 100 to a couple hundred thousand ticket size. All right. Thanks so much. Ben, welcome. Hi, Ben Narison. I'm a venture partner at NEA. So I carry two different hats. One is the NEA hat where we invest between one and a hundred million dollars. So multiple companies have been mentioned here. Patreon, we led the most recent round as an example. Uh, but I also am an active direct seed investor where I typically write $50,000 checks. In fact, today, because I've got this new COVID beard, I'm sporting a cohort member product, which is Outlaw Soaps. Nice. Uh, beard oil. All right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, next up is Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn. Oh, sorry. I, I muted. I, quick word of housekeeping. Um, be, if I hear background noise, I'll just default mute everyone who's not talking. So I apologize. If you find yourself muted, you'll have to unmute yourself before you talk, which is the case with you, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I'm Jocelyn Doe. I'm a partner at Builders. We're a Series A firm that's focused on modernizing essential industries. They, so they tend to be pretty unsexy, um, you know, uh, agriculture, logistics, transport, real estate, construction, et cetera. Um, we typically lead Series A investments writing five to $10 million checks. Um, we do have a pretty active seed program where we will write, you know, call it half a million to a million dollar checks. All right. Thank you so much. Keith, welcome. And please unmute yourself. You're still muted, Keith. All right. We'll come back to you, Keith. Uh, Laurel, you're next. Hey there. Um, my name is Laurel Toby. I'm a former journalist and also a founder myself. I uh, started a fund three years ago with Jenny Friedman, my business partner. It's called Supernode Ventures. We put in 50 to 100K checks. We don't invest in media, interestingly, but we, um, we are sect sector agnostic. We do B2B, SaaS, FinTech, Enterprise. And the way we add value is by helping with media. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Laurel. All right, Keith, you want to try it again? You know, unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Loud and clear. So Keith Bank, KB Partners in Chicago. Uh, we invest in early stage companies at the intersection of sports and technology, really hot emerging space. Uh, we're currently raising our second fund, which is a $100 million vehicle. Our first one was $41 million in size. 
Uh, typical check size in fund one was half a million to two million and kind of in fund two is going to be one to three million initially and reserve a similar amount for follow on. Uh, really excited about what we're doing um, and uh, focus is all across the board from sports betting, esports, uh, AR, VR, video streaming, immersive media, health, fitness and wellness, all those types of areas. All right. Thanks, Keith. Monique. Hi everyone, I'm Monique Woodard. I'm the founding partner and managing director at Cake Ventures. Um, we invest uh, average check sizes of half a million dollars, but it could be anywhere from 250 to up to a million um, into companies that touch areas of demographic change that are changing technology. So anything from um, this massive aging population to companies that can get to billion dollar outcomes based on uh, female user base or um, shifting, shifting culture. Um, I tend to like uh, future of work, consumer, uh, fintech, uh, and health. Um, and yeah, super excited to be here and can't wait to see more of you. All right. Thank you. Robert, you're up. Hey everyone. It's great to be here. I'm Robert Von Schnass. I'm at Maven Ventures. We're a early stage consumer software focused fund. So all of our investments are in software products that change how consumers are living their daily lives. And our typical check size is 750K to 1 million. All right, thank you. And Ryan. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Ryan, started a company called Product Hunt and now investing out of weekend fund. We write 100 to 200K check sizes. So maybe the smallest check size uh, out of this group or, or pretty close to it. And we're investing broadly across consumer and B2B, but we often look for companies who are really capitalizing on a consumer behavior shift, ideally something nascent, maybe something that people don't recognize, or some sort of new technology shift that enables new things to, to be built that weren't possible before. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you, investors. Um, all right. Well, let's kick us off with our first founder. Are you ready to go, Andrew from Sparkplug? Yes, I am. All right. Well, and then to queue up your deck. And um, for just a, a quick format thing, again, for syndicate members who are just joining us, if you have any questions for the founders, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and tag their name or their uh, company so we'll know that uh, who you're referring to. Um, and uh, investors, if you have any burning questions, you can also write QQ in the chat box, but I will call on you for those as well anyway. So, Andrew, you have three minutes. Three, two, go. Hey there, my name is Andrew Duffy and I'm the co-founder of Sparkplug, where we let brands bid on in-store influence. So meet Brittany. She's a senior marketing manager at PAX, one of our customers and one of the world's most successful legal cannabis brands. Now her job is to make sure that PAX products fly off the shelves at over a thousand brick and mortar retailers across four states. Unfortunately, that means contending with hundreds of other brands in a daily race to the bottom. Now, luckily she has a better option than price discounts or sales promotions. And that option is Andrea. She's an in-store employee at Lightshade, a 10-store retail chain in Colorado. Shoppers invariably ask her advice about their purchases, and 92% of them take her exact product recommendation. So getting Andrea to recommend PAX products is Brittany's holy grail. And this past quarter, Brittany needed a miracle. PAX just released an update to their flagship vaporizer for a big pre-Christmas sales push. It has new colors, extended battery life, and a host of other bells and whistles. But explaining those complex differentiators in the flash of a digital ad is almost impossible, and foot traffic at even top retailers has cratered due to COVID. So Brittany turns to Sparkplug to kickstart sales. She sets up a gamified reward for all of the employees at Lightshade, in this case, a head-to-head -head competition to sell the most PAX product from August through September. She sets up a public leaderboard and notification cadence to maximize that competitive dynamic. And instead of coordinating with 10 retail managers over a mile-long email chain, she uses our integrations into the retail point of sale system to select from a list of every location, employee, brand, and product in her network. So all she has to do is define those cash prizes that employees compete for. She sends that campaign over to the relevant retail managers for approval, then uses her dashboard to track standings and ROI across campaigns so she can optimize her next incentive. As you can see here, Andrea is in fifth place, but employees like her can then track their standings live via our SMS feed, keeping them engaged and aware of the incentives they can participate in with zero friction. Now, PAX offered the biggest prize of any brand on the platform that month, so Andrea focused her efforts, sold more devices, and surged ahead in the last week, winning her 100 bucks which she received directly via text through our digital gift card system. And in the end, PAX sold an additional $3,000 worth of product through just that one location. Brands increased sales by 38% on average with each campaign with a 6X campaign ROI. Retail associates take home an extra $102 per month, which is an effective 5 to 10% increase in their salary at no cost to their employer. And those retail employers are seeing a 15% increase in order averages, plus a 34% decrease in employee turnover 
which is one of their biggest costs. So everybody wins, which is why our referral flywheel from brands to retailers and vice versa has driven most of our growth. We've acquired 37 brand customers, incentivizing 3,600 influential employees at 146 retailers. We charge brands a subscription fee for access to the platform and variable fees for each incentive they run, with no fees for retailers or their store associates. That drove 36K in revenue last month, putting us at just about 7x growth since launching in February in our beachhead market of legal cannabis. We'll scale that to 10 million in annual revenue by end of 2022 and 100 million by end of 2024 by penetrating our next up markets of beauty and outdoors, among others, where we already have our first pilot customers and have kicked off that referral flywheel. We're unlocking a huge untapped market by doing for in-store marketing what demand side platforms and ad exchanges like Right Media and Google Ads did for digital. And our team has the tech, CPG, and market making experience to do it. We're Sparkplug and we let brands bid on in-store influence. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks. All right, well done, Andrew. Okay, investors, uh, let's take some questions. We'll start with you, Andrea. Question for Andrew. Oh, yeah. I think it's so cool that you had uh, one of your users names an- named Andrew in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I have a two-part question. My first is, um, why did you choose cannabis as one of your first verticals that you are targeting? And then you also mentioned, I'm just reading your, um, your business plan here, uh, your little snippet, and it says that you reward um, key influencers with cash for every sale they generate. How do you manage that? Uh, how do you manage the float? And from an accounting standpoint, how do, you ma- how do you manage the cash rewards? All right. Thanks so much. Andrew, question for Andrew. <laughs> A good name. Um, I, I think the biggest question for me is what's the unique customer acquisition channel that you've had to get these folks who are unique influencers in particular, uh, would love to know, um, how that, uh, works. If an influencer does uh, this particular person does very well, how does that work, um, in the LTV CAC equation? All right. Terrific. Um, Anil, how about you? Question for Andrew. Um, yeah, I guess maybe uh, just more high level. What uh, what inspired you down this route, and what's what's like your uh, five year vision? Where, where does this end up? All right, great. And we have uh, let's take one from our syndicate. Mohammed is asking, what disclosures are required on behalf of employees who are incentivized to sell a given product? So you want to tackle those, Andrew? You have two minutes. Awesome. Well, Andrea, great question. So why we chose cannabis starts with why we chose influential retail or what influential retail verticals we target. So we target verticals where that point of sale employee is really powerful in determining what product that customer will buy. And that requires those verticals to have a high diversity of SKUs. So lots of different products, differentiation across those SKUs, lots of reasons to choose a different product, undereducated or underexperienced consumers, and a high consequence of purchase, which either comes from expense or the experiential nature of the product. So that not only describes verticals like beauty and outdoor gear and supplements, but also cannabis to a T. So cannabis was highly influential. So that was the first step. The second piece is that cannabis is a really new startup market with a regulatory boundary around it, which prevents incumbent competitors like your NCRs or your Nielsen's, which are data aggregators or platform providers coming in and trying to compete with us. The uh, startups in the industry, all of the plat- all the products and retailers um, are also really open to new workflows and trying out new products so we could iterate really quickly. It was really just a great place to be starting a new company and getting our platform up and running quickly. Um, how do we manage the cash flow? It's really simple. Uh, we have APIs into a digital gift card system uh, and the brands that are incentivizing just uh, ACH cash directly into that whenever they uh, request to push an incentive out through the platform. So that's pretty simple. Um, Andrew, in terms of the customer acquisition channel, so we acquire those influencers by acquiring the retailer. So we get them all at once by integrating into their point of sale system, getting all the transactional data from each of those retailers, and then subsequently creating a loop between the retailer and that brand. Um, We acquire brands and retailers via referrals internally between the networks of those two. So brands have hundreds of retailers they sell to. We onboard a brand, we get a big chunk of those retailers referred to us and vice versa with retailers who have brands on their shelves. Um, Anil, in terms of what inspired me down this route, um, so in undergrad, I studied behavioral economics. I'm really fascinated with the ways in which we can change behaviors at a market level by small nudges on the personal level. Um, In terms of my sort of motivation for starting the company, I also see the imbalance between capital and labor and the economic inequality there as a huge problem facing our economy and the efficiency of businesses like the brands and retailers we service. And this platform allows us to help to fix that by giving people value based on the value that they create. Um, In terms of uh, the disclosures that are required, so we leave that to the retailer. Some of them disclose via a little plaque on the uh, the counter, and some of them don't even tell the the customers because they're being incentivized in other ways already. Uh, Happy to answer any more questions in the chat. 
All right. Thanks, Andrew. And you have a few more questions in the Q&A. Um, syndicate members, please do tag uh, the name of the company or the uh, the founder so they know, because uh, we'll want to be able to make sure they get to answer your questions. All right. Well done, Andrew. Um, and welcome, Jason. Oh, hey, everybody. Sorry, I got a little bit of a cold. It's not coronavirus. Don't worry. I've been tested. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, yeah, we, um, we moved to 100% remote uh, and we have two or three times as many amazing companies applying to join the accelerator. We're going to do, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 classes this year. We'll see uh, what the uh, quality of the applications is. We do only seven per class. We put $100,000 into each company. And then we typically will co-lead their seed round or at least participate in it to some level. So what we do is kind of like if AngelList and Y Combinator or Techstars plus a seed fund was all one organization. Um, so it's got pros and cons, but uh, generally it's a feature where we get to continue to invest in the companies. That's our goal. Uh, and can, and to keep investing maybe four or five times in the companies. Spark plug is really interesting for me. Uh, obviously, um, retail is you know, for considered purchases and any tool uh, if for the enterprise that can make salespeople more efficient tends to be a great investment. Um, and you tend to be able to charge whatever you want because it impacts sales. So we've had great success with companies like Lead IQ or um, anything that impacts sales, Grin. Uh, and the next company coming up um, is Athlete Studio, correct, Jackie? Correct. Okay. And so this is super interesting to us. Uh, any platform that helps you monetize and create um, revenue uh, for people and create businesses, that's going to be a winner, whether it's Shopify or uh, Squarespace, et cetera. And this is kind of like putting Cameo, Squarespace, and uh, but for athletes together. And uh, with that, Jackie. Yep. Here we go, Nicholas. And founders, uh, please remember to look in the Q&A box and continue to answer questions, ask your presentation. Are you ready to go, Nicholas? Yep. All right, three, two, go. My name is Nicholas Lemieux. I'm the founder and CEO of Athlete Studio, the number one platform for professional athletes. Demarcus Lawrence is the defensive end for the Dallas Cowboys. When COVID hit in March, he wanted to mobilize his teammates to raise money for small businesses and first responders in the Dallas area. The problem is that 99% of athletes don't have any marketing infrastructure. The process is manual. It takes one to three months to launch because traditionally you would need to hire a marketing firm, spend weeks reviewing designs, and continuously create content to generate revenue or pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire a dedicated team. Athlete Studio helps athletes deploy enterprise-grade marketing infrastructure in one to three days, allowing athletes like Demarcus Lawrence and his crew, the Hot Boys, to sell a $6,000 dinner with the team, a $5,000 sponsorship with Lowe's, and several VIP meet and greet packages to raise over $30,000 for the Dallas community. Our platform and technology normalizes all of the data available for professional athletes, allowing them to easily automate the creation of websites specific to their needs and automate the creation of content that helps them collect customer data and generate revenue. Athlete Studio is not an agency. We give the world's top agencies superpowers like Rosenhaus, Athletes First, and Vayner Sports. Agencies use the platform to monitor their athletes' marketing activities and earnings in real time. It provides insights on how to grow each individual athlete's brand. Athlete Studio takes 12% of gross revenue generated from sites. It costs us $250 to acquire an athlete, and they return that investment on average in 10 days. On the day of the 2020 NFL draft, Jason bet $100,000 on Athlete Studio when the fate of sports was uncertain. That resulted in over $330,000 in gross revenue our first season in market. We accomplished this by onboarding 41 pro athletes and averaging $21,000 in average annual run rate per athlete by Q4. To reach $100 million in revenue, we need to continue growing to 1,000 athletes and $100,000 in revenue per athlete. There's 300,000 professional athletes, a new category of SMB you might not be familiar with. In July of this year, the NCAA is going to change their name, image, and likeness rules to allow 180,000 Division I athletes to monetize their brands. To grow from 21,000 to $210,000 in annual run rate per athlete, we need to add new features to our site to help athletes generate revenue like auctions, advertisers, fundraisers, and give them the ability to collaborate with other athletes to create products. This represents a $63 billion e-commerce and advertising earning potential. And we're not going to wait for the NCAA to change those rules. Today, college athletes can sign up 
by requesting an access code from one of our professional athletes. My background is in software engineering and data science. I previously built the marketing infrastructure at Datto and Jebit, and our president, Chris, manages agency and league partnerships. He spent 15 years as a pro athlete agent. We're Athlete Studio, the number one revenue generating platform for athletes. And if you'd like more information on our upcoming round, email launch at athlete.studio. Thank you. All right, well done, Nicholas. Okay, investors, uh, to you, Ben, question for Nicholas. Sure, I'm the worst guy to lead off. Um, athletics of any sort are a total black hole for me. But I would assume there's as much a power law in the athletes that matter as there is in venture investing. I mean, you've got 300,000 athletes, but how many of them are people that are folks that have enough following for the consumer to care about, for them to generate a business that's big enough for your Shopify for athletes to be a large business over time. All right, thanks, Ben. Jocelyn, question for Nicholas. Hey, was that uh, Richard Sherman that I saw on your deck? Yep, I've got a call with Richard right, right after this, actually. Fantastic, tell him I said hi. I will. Um, could you address um, the defensibility of your model? All right, thank you. Uh, Keith Bank, question for Nicholas. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, the product is geared more towards charitable and social endeavors or is it more for money making uh, for the athletes? And then the follow on is similar to what Ben had asked. You know, the bigger tier guys that can generate more revenue typically have their own groups for this. Is this more for the tier two and tier three athlete or is this for the, for the true uh, superstars as well? All right, great. Um, let's take a couple from the syndicate. Ken is asking, uh, what is your pricing model? And Amit is, uh, what will be your moat in three to five years? Ready to take those, Nicholas? Yes. All right, two minutes. So on the defensibility of our platform, a lot of that has come down to building a platform and infrastructure that makes agencies' jobs a lot easier and helps them build better relationships with those athletes. So our pricing is low enough to where we can work with those agencies. And if it's in their contracts, they can still get the cut of their athletes' marketing earnings that they have. In addition to that, the data that we're collecting across pro athletes, across multiple sports right now, mainly NFL, but we're growing quickly in UFC as well, allows us to identify trends, opportunities, and use cases that we can use to help athletes create new revenue streams and uh, collectively share their customer database. So if we have two athletes on the same team or a same market, they can send an email newsletter to their audience cross promoting one another. So we really have seen great network effects that's made this platform defensible. And the more athletes that join the platform, the more they collectively grow their revenue. In terms of the power laws, we do see that play in effect with the 41 athletes that we launched. The majority of that revenue came from Chase Claypool on the Pittsburgh Steelers. But the thing with that is, and where agencies fail, is that can change at any time. Athlete has one big game. If Calvin Cater has a knockout live on ABC this Saturday, then they're going to multiply their business 10 to 100 fold. So really the most effective way to hedge our bets is put every athlete in the world on this platform so that we're there and we can predict those moments before they happen. And this is geared towards the tier one, two, and three athletes. There's no other content management system or platform that's uh, vertically specific in this space. So it's wide open. And it's honestly easier with the APIs for us to build for everyone um, and then use the data to uh, tailor and build, launch more of a Uber Black services for athletes like Chase or Richard Sherman um, who have that superstar power. And our pricing model is we take 12% of gross revenue generated from the websites. All right, nicely done, Nicholas. Okay, and our next founder is Lucy from Glowy. So uh, Hi, we everyone. have a um, <clears throat> theory about uh, direct consumer companies. If the uh, product is exceptional, unique in some way, and, and the founders are dedicated to growth um, and scaling the company and they have both of those, if you put them on an X, Y axis, like they know how to make an incredible product that's much better than what's out there. And they are very good at growth techniques uh, or committed to learning those and growing into that. Um, then we think it's a good bet to make if the product is a me too product and, you know, a copycat kind of product or the 
you know, team just doesn't get growth marketing. We, we haven't seen those investments work. So we've been very focused on any D to C having those two things, just a little observation for me and uh, three, two, go. Hey guys, I'm Lucy, the co-founder of Glowy. We make the only leggings in the world that truly support mums from pregnancy to motherhood and beyond. While I was pregnant with my first child, I suffered from back and pelvic pain. I was shocked to discover that no maternity brands were tackling this issue. At the time, I was a design director for sportswear giant Under Armour, and with the help of my co-founder, John, I invented a maternity legging that put women first. Meet Chelsea. She was one of the 80% of women that experienced lower back and pelvic pain during her pregnancy. Chelsea's solutions were either ugly and bulky or claimed to offer support that didn't actually work. Chelsea discovered our leggings on glowycollection.com. The patented design supports her lower back and lifts her bump to relieve pelvic pressure. It does this through an internal bonded support system that did not exist on the market until we invented the glowy. Her glowy leggings are so comfortable she never wants to take them off. They take her through all nine months of pregnancy and still fit her perfectly postpartum. Her glowies are the self-care that she deserves. They help her feel confident and supported as she enters motherhood. Over 1,500 women have already worn the Glowy and they are obsessed with our leggings. The Glowy is also the perfect gift for the pregnant woman in your life. Our average order value is over $120. Our CAC is declining and our profit is rapidly increasing. Over 10,000 women find out they're pregnant every day in the US. Our customer acquisition strategy is a mix of scalable digital ads, email campaigns, mums themselves to convert new customers and unpaid press. Our customer acquisition cost has dropped 26% and we are seeing a growing return on ad spend. Being pregnant is recession proof. We've sold out of our leggings three times this year since we launched. To reach $10 million in sales, we need 80,000 customers to spend on average $125, which is a tiny 0.5% of maternity apparel spend. As we scale to $100 million in sales, we only need 5% of pregnant women across Europe and US to buy around three items by 2024. Getting to three items is simple through category expansion, like the $9.6 billion denim market, which we plan to enter with our utility patented designs. We also see opportunity to introduce the Glowy to the $24 billion plus size market. We use data we collect from due dates to drive our customer lifetime value through personalized targeting. And we now have a repeat customer return rate of over 20%. Our small but mighty team that built the best maternity leggings in the world consists of myself and John. We met at Abercrombie and Fitch. I've designed for global brands such as Burberry and Under Armour. And John is a merchandising powerhouse and revamped the $2 billion apparel business for Sears. And yes, John is wearing the glowy leggings in that photo because they also help him with his Back pain. Glowy stands for giving love to women everywhere, and we support mums from pregnancy to motherhood and beyond. Thank you, and please check out our exclusive launch discount code. All right. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, investors, next up is Laurel. Question for Lucy. You had to give me the girly one, didn't you? You're next in. You're next in. <laughs> I can prove it alphabetically. We don't do any consumer. Um, it's really cool. Uh, I think you've, you've um, nailed this uh, product category. I think it, it is real and um, I'm super excited to see a woman develop this. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I guess my question is, you know, how are you, wh what's your, what's your go to market to reach the most number of uh, mothers as quickly as possible? Um, um, yeah, that's my main question. Great. And are you concerned that there isn't a lot of repeat customer use? So, uh, there aren't a lot of repeat customers because, you know, after they've been pregnant a couple of times, then they're done and you have to find a whole new set of customers, sort of like, you know, wedding gown businesses, the same, uh, you have the same challenges. So how do you, I guess you're going to expand your, your product line into jeans, but what else are you going to, what else are you thinking on your product roadmap? All right. Thanks, Laurel. Um, Monique, next. In the alphabet, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Fine. Um, great presentation, great pitch. Um, I'm a big fan of direct to consumer. Uh, my question is, I would love to hear your thinking about 
And I assume that when you buy one pair of leggings, they'll get you from, you know, month three to month nine. Why did you decide to go that route as opposed to say, you know, in months one through three, you'll have one pair of leggings in months four through six, you'll have another and so on. Um, you know, that would sort of increase the average order size and, you know, potentially delay your need to expand into denim and some other more um more complicated categories and then beyond denim are there other things that you think you'll be adding to the product line to the product mix all right thanks monique robert question for lucy i know with products like this customer acquisition can be challenging what are some of your strategies to keep your customer acquisition costs low all right, great. And we'll take some from Syndicate. We have a couple of questions asking about competition. How do you mitigate copycats? And uh, Hadley's asking anyone else doing this, if Lululemon comes out with a similar product, what happens to your business? Do you want to tackle those, Lucy? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you got two minutes. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to start with the um, competition and defensibility and all that, because that's one that always kind of comes up. Um, I don't really feel like we have any true competitors in the market because literally no one is using this technology in a maternity legging. There are two major maternity support legging brands out there, Blanky and Belly Bandit. Um, and both of them, they have leggings that are seamless knits, which is basically like putting on a pair of high-waisted tights. They offer zero support. They don't look good. They're not good quality and they have a loosely knitted belly, pa uh, belly panel that can fall down. Um, I also feel like we have a huge advantage, which is actually me. <laughs> um, my knowledge, expertise and connections in the world of performance apparel really gives us a unique advantage. Not to mention I was actually pregnant when we were developing these leggings, so I had a deep understanding of the product. Um, there are bigger brands that have tried this. Nike have actually just released the maternity legging themselves. It apparently took their design team three years to make. I bought the leggings and they're nothing more than a pair of high-waisted um, tights. They have zero support. So I feel like really a lot of these brands, they don't have the expertise and the ones that do, it's cumbersome and hard for them to do the job properly. Um, so in terms of kind of marketing strategy or go to market, um, we are going to be doing it all. We're going to be scaling our digital ads. We have a um, ROAS of 3.5. We're literally only spending like 1.5K a month. So imagine if we were spending 10K a month, how much more we'd be doing. We're going to go hard and organic. And I just want to stress like we, you know, we're tiny. We haven't even scratched the surface of the maternity apparel market yet. And we've already had so much traction. The women that become our customers become evangelists. They love the brand. Um, I'm sure many women out there that have had kids know that mums like to talk and spread the word. So we're going to go hard and organic. We haven't paid for any influencer endorsements so far, and we plan to continue that way. Um, so we're also going to be growing our social community. That's a huge um, part for us. We'll be doing referral programs um, and also going after pay PR. I'm sorry, I haven't managed to answer them all, so <laughs> I will answer them in the chat. <laughs> all right. Nicely done, Lucy. Um, Great. All right. Our next founder is Josh from Gage. Jason? Uh, yeah. So uh, Josh had uh, previously gone through the accelerator with another company uh, and then uh, started a new one. And he is a tremendous entrepreneur. Uh, in fact, was an entrepreneur in residence for us. And uh, this new company is uh, got a really interesting idea of how to uh, help facilitate the moving of used cars and it's working really well with that three two go great i'm uh, josh here hard with gauge and we've created an online auction for dealers to purchase vehicles directly from consumers so most people hate the process of selling a vehicle so i'll explain how we make that experience better with a real customer this is hadley who sold us her mazda cx-5 a few weeks ago and when hadley decided to sell her mazda she got an offer for 12.9 from a local dealer she wasn't very happy with so she listed on facebook marketplace for the kelly blue book value and received some interest but most of the people who reached out to her never actually came to look at the car and the ones who did offered even less than the dealer then she hears about gauge hadley can submit her vehicle using our app or we could take a look at her vehicle in person and do this for her, which is what she chose and now let me introduce you to one of our dealer buyers brett Brett's the used car manager at Ken Garf Nissan, and he spends almost 100% of his time looking for vehicles to purchase for his dealership to sell, and he can't find enough SUVs right now through his current channels to put in his inventory. So he logs into StockUp, 
which is our dealer auction portal, where we take all that information on Hadley's Mazda and convert it into the same detailed condition report format he's used to seeing at auction. So after some back and forth, he wins the Mazda with a bit of 14.2 plus our auction fees. And let me show you how this breaks down. Brett pays $14,630, which is what these would be going for at auction. We take our $350 buy fee and $80 to transport the vehicle to his lot, and Hadley receives $14,2. This is $1,300 higher than her other dealer offer and higher than any offer she received privately because we allow Hadley to sell her vehicle the same way a dealer sells vehicles that are not retailing, by making all the buyers compete at auction. And best of all, we didn't make her commit to anything up front. We just launched our pilot location in Salt Lake City at the beginning of September and have already done over a million dollars in GMV and over 27,000 in net revenue and are on pace to more than double this month. But probably more importantly, sellers love our process. One said it was literally the easiest private party car sale of our lives and dealers love it too. Brett even said, I'd buy all my used cars from StockUp if I could. We scale by taking a market-by-market market approach, first targeting the classified listings in an area before turning to paid and traditional channels. We could purchase 20% of the used vehicles sold in any given market, which is six times the largest player right now because of our boots-on-the-ground auction approach. We'll expand eight additional markets in 2021 and reach a 10 million annual net revenue run rate by January of 2022. And to get to 100 billion in GMV, we need to be in about 200 markets, which would be at about two and a half billion in net transaction revenue. And that doesn't actually include any additional buyer or seller services that are on a roadmap, like financing, which could easily quadruple our net revenue and profit on the same amount of GMV. I got into this through flipping cars and motorcycles through college, and then I founded and scaled the previous business to be buying over $80 million worth of vehicles per year, and Anna's managed product rollouts to over 2,000 dealers at a time while at driving sales, and we're developing the perfect team to take over this massive, extremely fragmented, mostly offline market. I'm Josh Hirohar with Gage, and we've created an online auction for dealers to purchase vehicles directly from consumers. Looking forward to the questions. All right. Great job, Josh. Okay. We're up to Ryan Hoover. Question for Josh. Good to reconnect, Josh. Um, yeah, so I'm curious to know maybe more about the, the risk that you see in the business and kind of how are you de-risking some of those uh, variables or, or those, those challenges. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Andrea, question for Josh? Uh, no question, other, just, other than uh, just a comment. I was an investor in Shift Technologies, which is also in the um, used or pre-owned uh, car marketplace. And it's just... Um, I don't know. It's kind of a crowded marketplace. So I guess that, that would be my question. How do you compete with all these other solutions out there? All right. Great. Oh, uh, Ben, looks like you have a question. You want to jump in there? Sure. It actually riffs a little bit off of Andrew. You know, Cox Mannheim is sort of the dominant player here, virtually a monopoly. Um, so one, how do you, how do you really take share away from them? And two, from an outcome standpoint, if you don't take the company public, Aren't they pretty much almost the only buyer? Are there like a tiny number of buyers here to, to take you out? So how do you think about exit? All right, thanks. Um, Andrew, question for Josh. Andrew Lee, right, yes, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey Josh, um, one of the big questions for, uh, for usually this market is financing. I'm wondering uh, how you're thinking about that in relation to um, uh, whether that's going to be some depth in the product. Is that a future iteration or is that something you're initially thinking about? All right, great. And let's take a couple from the syndicate. Daniel's asking, are you targeting end of lease buybacks as well or just straight sales? Uh, Ananda's asking, how are you marketing the platform to consumers on one side and dealers on the other? We have some duplicates there and you have two minutes, Josh. All right, sounds great. So I'll start with uh, Ryan's question. Good to see you again, Ryan. Um, the ways we're de-risking the business is first off, we don't hold inventory. Um, so we don't take any risk on the car where it's literally a pass-through in kind of our auction format. Um, even our locations themselves are very low overhead um, as well. So we get to kind of cash flow positive at a location pretty quickly. And then we do you know really detailed inspections on the car, both to you know protect the consumer and the, the dealer that's buying the car. And in terms of kind of the space in general, um, yeah, there's some overlap there, I think, with kind of the Cox Mannheim question as well as it's a crowded space. Um, there's a lot of players because it's a massive market, but even the largest player in the used car space has less than 3% market share. So it's very fragmented. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the space because of that. Um, in terms of an exit, this is, uh, you know, our plan is to go public. Um, we view this as being a, a big brand of the consumer that, you know, first, our target is to make selling a vehicle as easy as possible. And we do start to branch into other things like financing, because if someone's selling a car, they're likely to be buying their next one. And so whether they want to, you know, finance a purchase through us 
or you know get pre-approval on financing before going and purchasing their car. I think there's a lot of uh, areas we can add transparency and kind of advocate for the customer uh, in those scenarios. And um, in terms of uh, what type of transactions um, we handle, we do do lease buybacks as well. Uh, one of the nice things is we do have a dealer license, so we can handle all the paperwork and make it easier, not only for the consumer, but also for the dealer who's purchasing the car as well. So that's one of our big value adds to both sides of the market. And in terms of marketing on both sides, we do uh, direct outreach to customers who are selling their vehicles um, as we get started in a market. And then we start to see the inbound flywheel pick up because we are concentrated on small geographic areas. Um, you know, even just the other day, we actually had someone who we uh, looked at their vehicle and then their dad was selling a car a month later and he ended up uh, selling his car to us. Um, and then on the dealer side, we uh, reach out via email, phone. Um, a lot of these guys are old school. So sometimes the easiest thing to do is just walk in the dealership and uh, go talk to the used car manager, but happy to answer any other questions in the chat. All right. Great. Thank you, Josh. And reminder to founders, <clears throat> please go into the Q&A box and answer questions um, if you haven't already. Next up, we have Carlo from Udropi. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. We, uh, we love marketplaces. Uh, you just saw one and um, marketplace dynamics are really super interesting. And so is the supply chain. And this brings together enterprise software supply chain. And uh, we've seen some amazing stuff in the e-commerce space. And so we thought this was a really, really interesting uh, take and uh, it's been going really well. So you drop it, three, two, go. Ciao, my name is Carlo Bellati. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Flutropi. And we change the way entrepreneurs start and scale D2C brands. We already become the backbone of over 750 merchants who are generating over $12 million in B2C commerce sales, resulting in over 300,000 shipments managed throughout the platform. But let's meet one of our real clients, John. He's an entrepreneur who wanted to start an e-commerce business selling iPhone cases a few months ago. John knew at the time he can use platforms like Shopify to build the store in a few hours and also drive people to his shop thanks to Facebook or even post the story on Instagram. But what John didn't know is that below the surface was the biggest obstacle for his success. Finding and evaluating suppliers, logistics centers and warehouses with zero or low volume and integrate them with a sales channel, it is a nightmare. So John didn't know where to start and he was just so close to give up on his dream to open a first e-commerce business. But thanks to a friend, he discovered Udropi and Udropi is the missing piece of the puzzle here with the same simplicity it takes to build a shop on Shopify and to post a story on Instagram. John is able to set up all the logistics operation from product sourcing to last mile delivery through the simple and single integrated platform that only give him the ability to have the view across the whole value chain, thanks to the software, but also access to highly professional providers who want to work with you, Dropy, as we aggregate demand. Everything from drop shipping, sourcing, inventory fulfillment, and private label can be set up within the same platform. But let's see in action how John is automating, for instance, his drop shipping activities. After he successfully has created the shop on Shopify, he then came to us looking for a specific product, a luminous iPhone case, which we had in the marketplace already listed by a supplier. And because Shopify and Dropy are fully synchronized, the API, with just one single click, John is able to import the products into his shop. So his shop is only beautiful designed now, thanks to Shopify, but it's also full of products. And he can finally start advertising them on the web. And he just got an order from Susan. So let's see how he sees the order of Susan in the platform as well. So Susan's order, with, together with all the orders John has received that day, are here in the platform. The only thing that John has to do is click and fulfill them at once without taking care of operation at all, because you drop your route that order to the chosen supplier and shipping company. We charge the merchant from $19 to $249 per month, and we also take in a transactional fee from the GMV, which is the order value. Since we joined the program in August, the launch accelerator, it has been an acceleration for us from $50,000 net revenue to $120,000 in December. And January is looking even stronger. We're going to go up to 90,000 merchants from 750 today. It's in the $100 million mark. And we not only have the great funding team here, but we also have a great investment team who is able to make us do this. And Jason already invested in the company. And also Marco, who is not strange to Jason at all, the CEO and co-founder of Tamtac, is investing in the company in this round throughout the Sequoia Scout program. Thanks very much. And we changed the way entrepreneurs start and scale D2C brands. I'm looking forward to your questions.
All right. Thank you, Carlo. Investors, uh, Anil, you are up. Question for Carlo. Um, I guess, how do, you, uh, how do you just get all the merchants as quickly as possible? How, how do you go to market? All right. Thanks. Uh, ben, do you have a question for Carlo? Well, I guess if I were to oversimplify this, you find organizations that are willing to drop ship products on behalf of front end sellers. The front end sellers then build their stores around that. So are there concentrations of product categories, you know, like iPhone covers? And how do you react when I, as a merchant, have a product need that you don't cover? So I wanna sell men's blazers. You don't have men's blazers. How do you then spin that up to further your market? All right, thanks. And uh, Brett, welcome. Brett, this is your first question. You, you joined us a little bit late. Would you mind introducing yourself, your name, firm, average check size, and if you have a thesis? You got it. I'm thrilled to be here. Very impressed with the quality of company. Um, Brett Brewer, one of the founders of Crosscut Ventures, based in LA, investing out of our fifth fund, $100 million seed stage fund. Our average check size is 2 to $3 million of a two to $4 million seed round. And um, the thesis is pretty broad, but big categories of interest include space tech, health tech, mobility and transportation, um, enterprise SaaS across those, those businesses and, and marketplaces. Um, so that's a quick background. I guess when I think about this business, I would ask about um, how you think about scaling this business and, and what gives you concern through that scaling process. All right, great, thanks. And let's take from our syndicate. Uh, Brett is asking, what's the average cost to the entrepreneur to get started and selling? You wanna tackle those, Carlo? Absolutely. So, uh, so let's start with the pricing model and how much the entrepreneur has to pay uh, monthly. So it's as little as $19 um, to you know, set up a logistics operation from sourcing to last mile delivery. And we are as important as Shopify and Facebook. So they would need us, Shopify and Facebook, or even an influencer or a story on TikTok to be able to have a store, generate traffic, and then be able to uh, streamline the logistics operation. Uh, ben, when it comes to product categories, so we uh, kind of focus on the niche uh, social commerce category. So something that you might see on Etsy.com or Wish.com or the things that we kind of uh, uh, intermediate here. And, and very good question about the sourcing. So when, it, when we talk about e-commerce, we're talking about billions and billions of SKUs. Uh, and we, we don't have that supply yet, but we do the sourcing. So if a, a merchant, like an entrepreneur, he can, is coming to us and he doesn't find what he's looking for, he just asks. And this is automated, so it fills the form. And then you drop, you route that request to the network of suppliers who will eventually find that product and list that product into the marketplace. The entrepreneurs get notified, and then he's able to fulfill that transaction. So normally it takes up to four days to make this possible, uh, if it's possible. Otherwise, we go back with a notification that says, well, we're not able to source this product for you. Uh, Neil, when it comes to go to market, so I think that's uh, kind of, related to how do we scale. Uh, we've seen network effects kicking in, uh, kick in as well at a very early stage. So 80% of the suppliers that we have have been introduced by the merchants, um, which is super cool as this is scalable and we don't want to be related to Facebook ads and Google ads to acquire as many customers as possible at a very early, early stage. So we just give them the software and they can onboard their own suppliers and suppliers can onboard their own merchants because everybody here wants to be able to leverage technology to consolidate shipments and without the needs of you know, managing thousands of transactions. We have suppliers managing 500 orders daily, and they don't know, but those orders are coming from 400 merchants. Can you imagine managing 400 merchants with spreadsheets? It's a nightmare. So that's how we're planning to go to market very quick, and had, that's why how we uh, scale in the next future as well. But I'm running out of time, so looking forward to answering all those questions in the chat. <laughs> all right, well done, Carlo. Thank you. Thank Next you. up is Mehek from On Delta. Okay, we love um, online education. We've had some great experiences with um, Brilliant.org and uh, Steezy teaching dance, tone bass, musician teaching music. And uh, we love this new uh, ISA um, income sharing agreement movement where modest investors in Lambda and On Delta is um, really 
I think going to help people find great high paying jobs um, and without going into massive amounts of debt. And that is awesome. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Mahek. Three, two, go. Thanks, Jason. Hey, everyone. My name is Mahek. I'm the CEO of On Delta, and we're a business school that's free up front in exchange for future income. Meet Lorena. She wants to work in growth marketing at a tech company. She has a bachelor's degree in international relations. She's a self-starter and she has some experience. But how does she know where to start? There's so many fields within marketing, but let's say she chooses one. She still has to learn these skills on her own and then apply with thousands of other people through AngelList and LinkedIn. That's when she decided to come to On Delta. We're 15 weeks long. We provide 300 plus hours of learning experience to our students and we're full-time friendly. So students like Lorena can work a full-time job while going through our program. We're on Bundling Business School and we've created a repeatable model that can be used for any sector, not just marketing, starting off with our admissions process. We have a data-led application process that has helped us bring in 1,200 plus applications from 25 plus states. After students get accepted into our program, they go through our marketing curriculum. Our classes are completely live on Zoom, and we have a student portal where we're tracking our students' mastery as they're going through the program through quizzes and projects. After going through our marketing curriculum, we put our students through two weeks of career curriculum. This is where we help them identify their dream jobs, create their resume and decks, and they also learn outreach strategies because at the end of the day, we want to teach our students how to fish. After going through our curriculum, we put them through six weeks of an apprenticeship. This is a paid opportunity for the student, and it can be repeated if the student needs to get some more experience under their belt before they go to work for a company. And the way that we help our students land jobs is through our hiring partner relationships. We have 30 plus hiring partners that we're partnered with currently, and students can work on contract or in a full-time role after they graduate from our program. This is a quote from Lorena's apprenticeship company. They loved her so much that they hired her. And this is her cat that stayed with me for a few hours while she was moving into her apartment in San Francisco. The really exciting part about On Delta is that we're zero dollars up front. And that's because we use a financial instrument called income share agreements. We take 10% of our student salary for two years as long as our students are making over 40K per year and our students are never gonna have to pay us more than 18K. Since launching in September, 2019, we've signed $500,000 in income share agreements and we have a 60% placement rate. The exciting thing about that number is it's surely going to rise because we just had 10 students just start um, a few weeks ago. For us to reach $10 million in income share agreements, we'd have to place 700 students. And for us to reach $100 million, we'd have to place 7,000 students. And the way that we plan on doing that is through building the business school of the future. Today, we're offering very specialized marketing classes, but tomorrow we want to offer classes in sales development, human resources, and other non-technical spaces. The way that we're acquiring customers is through organic content. We launched a TikTok over the summer and already have 30,000 followers, and we received 900 plus applicants through our content. I'm also no stranger to, stranger to social media. I was named by Forbes as a top 10 Gen Z expert, and I've helped CEOs and VCs across the Bay build their brand online. Our growth instructor, Tyler, did the growth curriculum at Draper University, and Nelson built a career consulting firm from the ground up. We're on Delta, and we're a business school that's free up front in exchange for future income. I'm really looking forward to your questions. All right. Thank you, Mahek. All right. Investors, Jocelyn, you are up. Question for Mahek. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for that. Um, my question is around uh, your screening process for appli your applicants as well as the dropout rate. What happens when the ISA um, agreement when uh, a graduate drops out before completing your program? All right, thank you. Um, Keith, question for Mahek. Yeah, two. Uh, first, does the employer pay directly uh, to you? Um, so there's not a collection issue, number one. And number two, could you just talk a little bit more about the types of jobs that you're able to place people into both um, uh, pay and, and industry type? All right, thanks. Laurel, question for Mahek. Yeah, um, my main questions are around accreditation um, and why business school and not something that's more traditionally apprentice type. Uh, so like, I don't know, journalism where you don't really need a degree or accreditation or um, I don't know, um, coding or something like that. Because um, I would think business school, you definitely want to be, feel like you have an accredited degree when you graduate. All right, thank you. And let's take a couple from Syndicate. James is asking, um, is there a market to resell the income share agreements? Diana, what's, what's average income for your job placements? 
Sorry, Jackie, what was the last question? The average income for your job placements for your students. So two minutes. All right, um, Jocelyn, to start off with your question, um, our screening process right now is we have an online portal that we have applicants apply through and we then put them through an extensive interview process where we ask them a lot of questions. We might have them send some things into us if we need it. And uh, we use the program as a way to filter for if the students are actually a good fit for us to place. So for the first week, we don't charge our uh, students everything, anything if they decide to drop out. But after that, going up to week eight, the ISA is tiered. So let's say they drop out in week four, they would only have to pay uh, like, I think it's six or 7% of their salary instead of the full 10. Um, Keith, um, does the employer pay directly? Uh, absolutely not. And that's because we don't want to limit our students access to companies. Let's say I have a direct relationship with a friend at Google. I want to be able to give my student that opportunity to go and land a job at that company without having to work with Google's team to create a partnership. Um, the types of jobs that we're placing our students in, uh, we're mainly just teaching paid acquisition right now. So we're placing our students in demand generation roles. And Laurel, this leads into your question about accreditation. Because the programs are so specific, um, like with paid acquisition, uh, we can prove quantifiable results with our students and say, hey, this student, whenever they were going through our apprenticeship, we're, we're able to provide X results for this company. And we know that they'd be able to do that for you as well. And in the future, specifically with marketing and sales, you don't need a degree anymore to go out and do that. And these companies are looking for people with experience. And that's where we're starting to see the trend moving. Um, James, is there a market to resell the ISAs? Absolutely. Um, we will, we're seeing now that funds are starting to come in and helping with securitizing the ISAs and buying them up front um, for a little bit cheaper. And um, the average income for the students that we've placed so far, um, if they're working for a company in the Bay Area or in a city, it's anywhere between 70 to 80K. Students that are working remotely um, or are in a, in a more in a flyover state area, they're probably making anywhere between 50 to 60K per year. Thank you so much. Um, I'll answer some more questions in the chat. All right, well done, Mahek. Okay, and for our seventh LA20 founder, we have Francisco from Storybook. Francisco and Presh, are you ready? Uh, so we love consumer subscription. Obviously, sleep is a big thing. And if you have kids, sleep plus kids is challenging. We did really well with the com.com investment. Uh, some of you syndicate members were in on that uh, early investment. And um, I actually know a little bit about this uh, baby massage stuff because my wife uh, got into it. And uh, it actually is a thing. So it works. And with that, three, two, go. My name is Francisco. I'm the CEO of Storybook, and we help parents make their kids fall asleep. This is Carla. She's a mom of two boys. Daniel, her eldest, is having trouble sleeping. And just like him, there are 800 million children ages 0 to 10 who experience sleep issues. Now, Carla found a Storybook after seeing an Instagram ad. She downloaded the app, created her account, and she told us that Daniel was having trouble sleeping and nightmares. So we will present stories based on that, which in fact are audio stories. She will go for night mode first, and now she, uh, he will listen to the stories while mom following, follow the guidelines. His head is full of many things. Who is looking for the snake who slithers down slowly? And just like that, Daniel is going to fall asleep because there is no screen time Massage techniques will increase the production of melatonin. And most importantly, mom is right there, providing love and security. And that's something competitors don't do. Storybook is the only app to combine infant massage, bedtime stories, and music to help children relax and sleep better. We are a free to download app, and we have a $48 yearly subscription plan. We have more than 45 original audio stories. We release around four new stories every month. Our stories. Uh, will help kids explore their emotions, reinforce their self-esteem, and learn new things. As per the latest survey, 79% of the parents say that their kids are sleeping better, are sleeping four times faster, and 89% of the parents feel more connected with their kids. We've been the number one app in 60 countries. We've had more than 800,000 downloads. And we have more than 3,000 five-star reviews. Like this one from Jesse. We tried everything under the moon to get my four-year-old to sleep. 
I am more relaxed, she is more relaxed, no more bedtime fights, can't praise this app enough. Or this one from Oscar. This app has made my night so much more peaceful, also strengthened our father and son bond. We have over 13,000 paying subscribers in 150 countries, although 46% of them come from the US and Mexico. And interestingly enough, 72% of them are Spanish speakers. And again, no competition in here. 68% of our acquisition comes from paid channels, 32% from organic. Our average ARPU is $43, and our CAC is usually half of that. In 2020, we uh, got $400,000 in ARR, and we grew 29% on average month over month. We plan to achieve 100 million ARR by 2025, which means acquiring 1.4% market share in our top eight performing countries. Our founding team combines industry experience, early simulation background, and we are on track to do for infant well-being what Calm and Headspace are doing for adults. And these are our own kids sleeping. We are a storybook and we help parents make their kids fall asleep. Looking forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Francisco. All right, investors, uh, Monique, you are next. Question for Francisco. Uh, thanks, Francisco. Um, sleep hygiene is hugely important for people, especially kids. Um, so you mentioned that you're focusing on ages from, I believe that you said one to 10. There are hugely different um, you know, needs around con needs and pre preferences around content. So how are you managing the content production um, within sort of that one to 10 band? All right, great. Ryan, question for Francisco. So I didn't know this was a thing. I'm not a parent, so uh, maybe no surprise, but uh, very fascinating. I'm curious to know more about the, the market and competition. Uh, maybe not exactly direct competitors, but even melatonin itself, maybe that is a competitor. I'm just curious to hear your, your thoughts on the market landscape. All right, thanks. And uh, back up to you, Andrea, question for Francisco. Yes, you mentioned um, some of the countries that are also using the product. And I was just curious, how many languages in general has this been translated into? And then I guess the same would be true with Monique's question. Um, do you have a marketplace or anything like that uh, or plans to develop a marketplace if people have content uh, generation ideas? All right, great. And some from the syndicate, David's asking, how much does it cost to develop each story, freelance or internal? Um, and Ken's asking, how long will a typical child use storybook? I'll let you title, tackle those, Francisco, two minutes. Yes, so I'll start with uh, Monique. Uh, yes, uh, the, the needs in those, uh, in that broader spectrum of ages is pretty different, um, but 55% of our users have kids ages zero to three and 45% of them four to 10. Uh, and we created a uh, content based on that. So we have uh, short stories, 45 seconds long, pretty simple for babies. And we have three to four minute long stories with more complex issues, like uh, talking about emotions, which was pretty popular during the first months of pandemic. So it's feeling uh, sad, feeling angry, feeling uns uh, unsafe. Those topics worked really great with um, older kids. And um, yeah, talking about uh, languages, uh, we currently have Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And even though we only have those three languages, we have a, a paying subscribers in 155 countries. So that definitely shows, um, Ryan, there's a global need for this. Um, and I love the question about competition because um, there are some um, apps that uh, have audio stories for kids. And with those apps, you, you just leave your device next to your kid's bed and walk, off, uh, walk away from the room. Uh, with Storybook, we are actually helping the parents to for them to be the ones who put their kids to bed. And the benefit to that is that they, they will get to sleep but also, and more, more importantly, they are sharing time, quality time with their parents. And the physical stimulation will release melatonin and the physical stimulation will uh, create a stronger bonding between the two of them. Um, talking about melatonin and super quick, we had a case of a, a baby who had a problem in his brain and their parents, because of the pediatrician told them, gave him melatonin and he, he started to feel in a depressed state. Uh, and they stopped that, uh, but the child couldn't sleep until they tried the storybook. That's a great story. We have it on our YouTube channel. And uh, about the cost, 
it, it takes about a um, thousand to a thousand five hundred dollars to create content for these three languages. Uh, we release around four new stories every month, uh, and we do them all internally. And talking about marketplaces, back to you, Andrea. Um, as of now, we are creating everything, but we are um, always talking to our users and trying to find out what are the biggest topics for them. And uh, yeah, I'll follow up in the Q&A section. Thanks so much. All right, great, thank you. Okay, those are our seven from LA20. We have a bonus, um, Kristen from Statusphere. She's an alum and she's gonna give us her three minute presentation. You ready to go, Kristen? Yes. Yeah, and um, we now have this huge alumni base and we're really excited uh, about the great progress Statusphere made. I think you were in which class, sixth or seventh? It was seven, yeah. Seven, okay, good. My memory is getting better. All right, three, two, go. Hi, my name is Kristen Wiley, founder of Statusphere, and we help brands scale their word of mouth marketing. Meet Katie. She's the marketing manager for Sephora's in-house brands, and she's also one of our current clients. She's also one of the 64% of marketing executives that believe word of mouth is the most effective form of marketing. And when she went to go scale word of mouth marketing, she thought there'd be tools to do it, just like she has tools for social, scaling her social and scaling her search and email. But she realized there were no platforms to scale word of mouth until she found Statusphere. With Statusphere, we can get thousands of people talking about her brand at the push of a button. And here's how it works. Members apply to join our network. So here's Kita, one of our real members. They fill out a profile about themselves so we can learn if they have sensitive skin, they shop at Target, if they're expecting children or if they have children. We learn all of these things about them so that we can match them with the right products each month. So Kita here was matched with these four items, one of them being Katie's item from Sephora. She can then read about each item and see if she wants to get this product for free in exchange for doing required actions. So a required action could be posting on social, leaving a review or attending an event. Kita does decides that she wants this in her box, she selects it, we ship it to her, and she posts about it and she puts it in her portal so that the, the brand can see it. And then she can get her next box next month for free as well. Uh, how it works on the brand side is Katie then logs into her portal, can see all of her content, purchase more required actions from our members, um, and see which content is performing best. And how we make money is Katie pays for a flat rate cost per action, and they can sign up for either campaigns of 10 to 10,000 guaranteed actions for each brand, or a subscription plan, which is what Katie's on, for a guaranteed number of actions per month. We've worked with more than 200 paying brands in a variety of industries. Um, and you can see our revenue growth over the last two years here. We closed our pre-seed funding in 2019 of 575K, and we've grown our annual run rate into a 1.4 million, closing out 2020. We're, our customer acquisition, we have down to a science. We have a 13% conversion rate from, from demo to client. And right now, our current average annual spend per brand is a little over 11,000, increasing each month. And our customer acquisition cost is a little under 2,000. We also grew our returning customer revenue by 300% in 2020, as more customers are not only returning, but they're spending more upon return. We've been extremely capital efficient. We spent 450K in 18 months to reach a 1 million annual run rate, and we actually became profitable in December, which has been phenomenal. Uh, our roadmap is here to reach the 100 million annual run rate mark, even though I know we can even surpass that as well, and the number of new brands and total members we need to get there. And here's our stellar team that's going to do it. There's myself. I have uh, experience working in more than seven years in content marketing, working for brands like Hershey's and Coca-Cola to create content for them. We have Teresa, who's the queen of processes. She actually used to work at NASA. And Cassie is our CTO. She ran a dev shop for five years, and she's actually, uh, we acqui hired her whole team because uh, they loved it, what they were building so much. Um, and I wouldn't be a proper CEO without saying we're hiring and promoting that as well. So we are growing, we're hiring, and these are the positions available. So please uh, reach out if you know anyone. Thank you. All right. Nicely done, Kristen. All right. Well, let's take some questions. Um, Andrew Lee, question for Kristen? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear um, uh, whether <laughs> this is this is honestly just 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 an interesting question because you're you're such an expert in this field. Um, what's been the most interesting channel uh, as you've uh, as with during COVID? What's been the thing that has been surprising? All right, thanks, Anil. Question for Kristen. Um, I guess yeah. Just uh, what other tools are there out there? Um, I, I feel like I've seen some other things like Popular Pays. Maybe it was called as a YC one. Um, and then what's, uh, what's like the secret sauce to just grow as quickly as possible? How do you get, and is it important to get like much larger influencers uh, over time? All right, thanks. Brett, question for Kristen. Brett or Ben? Uh, Brett, or either one. 
How okay. about you, Ben? Do you have a question? Uh, I don't know if I have a question. I did send a note to my daughter to check it out. Feels like it's right up her alley. Excellent. How about you, Brett? Nothing jumps to mind, but an impressive other people call on the business. All right, great. We have some um, syndicate questions. Um, how are you different from Grin and other similar services? Um, and uh, Joe is asking, are you accepting small investors? Exam 10, 10K, for example. <laughs> Can I go? Is that good? Go for it. Two okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. In term, in terms of investors, will hopefully be syndicating. So I would direct you toward that direction for smaller check sizes. Um, in terms of our competition and how we're different and the other platforms out there, I actually use most of the other platforms that are in this space, and that's why I created this one because I just wasn't happy with most of the solutions. Um, so Grin is a great platform, but they are much more of a like a CRM for for managing um, influencer and referral marketing and pieces like that. So you still have to do all the work with uh, Statusphere. It's like a press the button and we do everything all the way down to fulfillment as well. Um, so it's just a little bit different in terms of, um, you know, if you want to hire an entire team, then you'll need something like Grin. But if you're running to just set it and forget it, um, kind of like Facebook PP CPC ads, that's where Statusphere comes in. Um, in terms of our kind of um, secret sauce and kind of the size of the influencers, I think was your other question, Anil, is uh, we work with micro influencers, I guess is the, the term. Um, but I actually think really anyone can be an influencer, anyone that influences buying decisions. We're finding better and better results with smaller and smaller, more normal people, which has always been my goal is allowing, is creating a network of where you're shopping from real people that look and live like you do. Um, and creating a really a recommendation engine at the end of the day. Um, so we have a very grand vision um, and we've really set the platform for that, which allows us to create a pretty big moat and make it pretty hard for other people to um, compete because you do have to build it in these stages. Uh, and then the other question about the interesting channel during COVID, um, love this question. I will say the most interesting one is TikTok, even with all the chaos of this year, the amount of sales that TikTok is generating is phenomenal. Um, we had even our own website, more than 10,000 hits in less than 24 hours from one video. Um, I think that uh, one of the other, um, I think on Delta, Mihak, she was talking about how it's working great for her brand. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Um, TikTok is a, a weird place. <laughs> I think we're going to see a lot of upsets in the social space in the next few uh, years. And that's why I think uh, it's a perfect time to build this platform um, in general. But I'll answer the rest of the questions in the chat. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Kristen. All right, investors, here comes the hard part. We are going to ask you to give us your top three um, of the seven in LA20. Um, for, can't vote for Kristen, but you can invest in her if you choose. But for this purposes, please, your top three of the seven that you saw. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go around and ask you for your kind of in backwards order. I'll call on you kind of like with the questions. Your number three, your number two, just the name of the company. But then give us also give us your number one and why you voted for them. So you could say some nice things about them. Okay. If anyone is ready, we'll start with any, any of the investors. We'll just take the first. No ties. Give a, no ties. You can, <laughs> give four, you can give four honorable mentions. And obviously, Statusphere is not in it. So the first seven only. Uh, and then if you want to invest in the companies uh, or meet with them, please do that. And if you have any companies that um, you love and you think would fit our thesis, which is, I don't know, modest traction is what we look for, exceptional products, uh, some customers we can talk to, two to 10 maybe. It's kind of our sweet spot. And it was really nice to see um, so many friends and all-star investors here. That was really impressive. What a what a crew, Laura. Lock up first. Ben. <laughs> she <and> did. <laughs> Andrea. Just so many uh, amazing investors here. Ryan, Monique, Andrew from Initialize. Just this is a high quality group. Yeah, really appreciate everyone joining us today. Okay. Well, just trying to wait for your stake when it when COVID ends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know. It's It'll a be there. We, I think it's three classes I haven't had a barbecue for. And so I was like, oh, I'll just have a group barbecue when it's over. And then I was like, I guess I got to get a second smoker because I don't know if I can, how much meat I can smoke here. But I mean, we have the room for, we could have 200 people here at the house, but I don't know if my smoker can feed 200. Mm -hmm. So, Presh, you got work to do, Presh. You get over here and smoke some meat. Presh is a vegetarian, except when I'm, barbecuing or he goes with me to Tokyo or Australia and he comes to Michelin star restaurants with me. It's pretty good work for me, isn't it, Presh? 
Not not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. What's what about the what bucket list trips have you been on with me? Only like three or four. Only three or four. <laughs> okay. Those Scuba diving the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, forward. twice. Tokyo, twice. <laughs> That's a good job. What was uh, that, Ben? Did you were you going to say something? Oh, my son just graduated from UCSD. So if you need another one to travel. Oh with. yeah, we, we um I have um we don't we don't do internships except for my friends' kids. Man, he graduated. Um, so send your if you have kids. I'm I'm getting the favor bank going now. Uh, so that we have a eight week internship program. We used to do it in person. It was really good. It's really good for the favor bank too. But I'll give you the votes if you want them. Okay, let's do it. All right, you ready, Ben? We'll start with you. All right, you're three, two, just the name of the company, and then you're one and why, please. Three, you droppy. Two, on Delta. Number one, gauge, because even though there's a duopoly that runs that business right now, feels like they're long needed to be disrupted. Now I did fund or try to fund a company that was trying to do that, which went away. Um, but hope springs eternal. It's a huge market. And if somebody digital can take it over, it's a big, big outcome. All right. Thanks, Ben. I, I can do mine. Brett. That's good. All right, Brett, go for it. Number three, storybook. Number two, gauge. And number one, on Delta. Um, just because I'm really interested in education tech and I like new models and I think potentially the, the business model of it could be transformative and, and, and spread. All right. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Andrea, you want to go? Let me unmute myself. Okay. So this was hard. Actually, quality was really good across the board. So um, I would say number three is Athlete Studio. Uh, number two is You Droppy. And, uh, no, I'm sorry. Number two was glow glowy. And number one was you droppy. Um, and that was tough for me because I really liked glowy a lot, <laughs> but I think you droppy I chose as my number one, um, just because setting up a, a supply chain is really hard to do. And anything that they can, anything that this company can do to ease um, that process, I think is a good thing. I like their ability to scale, grow marketplace and ease of use. And it really reminded me, um, of what uh, Wish and Rappi were trying to do when they started off. And those were my early investments and I've had good luck with both. So that's why I chose you, Droppy. All right, great, thanks. Those three different number ones so far. Andrew Lee, your three, two, one, please. Okay, uh, this is also difficult. Uh, excellent, excellent presentations all around. Um, my three is gonna be glowy. Um, cause it's so, uh, different. It's, oh, well, let me just give the names. Three is glowy. Uh, two is on Delta. One is you droppy. And the reason why I chose you droppy was because, um, though it clearly drop strip drop shipping is a, is a real thing that people make money off of, but more importantly is like combining those two parts of the supply chain along with what's happening in e-commerce. There's clearly some type of wave that's occurring there. And that intersection is important. All right. Thank you. Anil, your three, two, one, please. Yeah. Um, so three, uh, spark plug two you droppy and one, um, and we're a little bit biased here as investors, uh, on Delta and, uh, we're really passionate about ed tech and democratizing education, allowing, uh, anyone with a, um, internet connection, uh, to advance themselves. All right. And thank you for that. Jocelyn, your three, two, one, please. Number three, on Delta to you Droppy and number one gauge. I mean, this is a huge addressable market, pen and paper market, um, really antiquated markets that we love. Um, and the company has a really interesting and smart solution to attack it. All right, terrific. Um, Press your keeping score. Uh, Keith had to jump off, but he gave me his top three before he left. His number three was on Delta, his number two is Athlete Studio and number one is Glowy. Okay, and Laurel, you are next, please. Phenomenal founders and great presentation. So this was tough. Um, my number three was you Droppy. My number two was Gage, and my number one was Spark Plug. Uh, I think it's a really innovative product. I haven't seen a lot out there like this. Um, I think it's it's really important to engage and find new ways to get retail associates to sell harder. Um, I think that solves a big problem for retailers in general. Um, I would I have a lot of questions and want to find out more, but that was my number one. 
All right, thank you. Monique, you're up next, please. Number three was Glowy. Number two was On Delta. And number one, I went Storybook. Um, you know, I, I, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about sleep and good sleep hygiene, as well as mindfulness. And I think that um, there's an opportunity for that to be sort of trickled down into the kids and children's space. Um, and interested to see how the content production evolves as he sort of tackles that wide band of, of one to 10. And if uh, Storybook can carve out, you know, a very specific niche around that combination of like tactile touch from parents with, um, you know, mindfulness. And I like subscription commerce. All right, excellent, thank you. Okay, Robert had to jump off, but he gave me his top three before he left. Um, his number three was Udropi, number two, Storybook, and his number one was Sparkplug. Um, and Ryan Hoover, you are up next and last. Who are your top three, please? All right, so number three, Sparkplug. Uh, number two, On Delta. And number one, I put Storybook as well, same as Monica. Monique, um, I think, one, I think it feels like a, a budding uh, ecosystem, kind of going back to what Monique said around like mental health and, and sleep uh, kind of awareness. It's also a massive market that maybe a lot of people don't realize. And parents tend to talk a lot. So when something works, they, they speak. And then the last thing I'll say is their traction is really strong, uh, consistent. I think it was 20% month over month growth uh, almost this, this past year. So uh, yeah, well done. All right, great. So Presh, before you give us the final score, can you quickly uh, do the poll for the syndicate members? Yeah. So they sure. could be voting before sure. we reveal the final vote. So syndicate members, can you please vote and give us your number one? Okay, Presh, what is the final score from our investor panelists, judges? Oh, you're on mute, Presh. My bad. All right, final score uh, on Delta in first place with nine points. Uh, second place is Udropy with 7.5. And third place is Gage with six. All right, well done, founders. Okay, and our poll for syndicate members is still going. Three, two, <laughs> two thanks for coming, one. everybody. This has been amazing. I hope you all are safe. You droppy with 20. Wow, look at that. That I mean, it was a, there was a lot of parity in this class. I have to say, like, uh, the companies were all. It was a very well-even really, class. Yeah, yeah, very tight. It, was, it wasn't like a breakout season uh, as such. So appreciate everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, better days are coming. We hit 720,000 vaccinations yesterday, which is double where we were 10 days ago. We'll be over a million next week. And uh, West Virginia is just, every shot they get is in somebody's arm within 24 hours. California and New York, 25 and 35% of shots used. So they're doing the worst. And I think most of us are in those two states. Uh, but pretty soon we'll all be getting shots and seeing each other in person. So anything else, Jackie? That's it. I just wanted to congratulate the founders for an amazing, yeah. for all your hard work over the last, uh, this last cohort. You're all incredible. Yeah. And um, you thank you, all the investors. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really yeah. appreciate it. And we, and we will, time. in all likelihood, be syndicating everybody uh, if they want to do that.